All right, the last three weeks we spent on evangelism and talking about harvesting. And the next four weeks, we're going to spend four weeks in Genesis 38. We're going to take this theme that we were talking about harvest, and we're going to continue on that. And now we're going to talk about reaping. The sermon series that we're going into is titled, Reap What You Sow. Meaning that if you sow bad seed, you're going to reap a bad harvest. If you reap sow good seed, you're going to reap a good harvest. Okay? So we're going to spend a little time in Genesis 38. We're going to break it up into four weeks, and we're, we're going to learn the lessons here in Genesis 38. Now, today we're talking about responsibility. Responsibility is the quality or state of being called or able to answer for one's conduct and obligations. Let me read that one more time. Responsibility is the quality or state of being called or able to answer for one's conduct and obligations. That's what responsibility is. Okay, now we're going to be in Genesis 38. We're going to read verses 1 to 10. And while you're flipping there, we need to give a little background information. You see, Genesis 38 is in the middle of the story of Joseph. Joseph had just been called or sold into slavery by his brothers and now we've got this chapter 38, which seems to be just kind of this random story in here, but it's not random at all. You see, Genesis 38 is about Judah. It's about the line of the Messiah. You see, Judah was the line that brought about the Messiah. So this isn't just some random story. This is, this is telling the story of Judah and, and what happened to him. Before we go much further talking about Judah, I want to take a look at a couple of maps. And I see this is the Sinai Peninsula and uh, Canaan is up there. See that body of water down there on the right hand side? That is the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee is north of that. That's the land of Canaan. Judah left the, um, the, the colony where his parents and all of his brothers were living. And in the first set of verses there in, in Genesis that we're going to read here in a minute, he says he married an Adulamite. That's where that red dot is. That body of water on the very far edge is the Dead Sea. It's just to kind of give a little map and a, a little kind of setting on, on where this is all at. Okay. So we're going to go to Genesis 38 and talk about Judah and the, the line of the Messiah. At that time, Judah left his brothers and settled near an Adulamite named Hira. There Judah saw a daughter of a Canaanite named Shua. He took her as a wife and slept with her. She conceived and gave birth to a son, and he named him Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She gave birth to another son and named him Shelah. It was at Cherizim that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife. Perform your duty as her brother-in-law, and produce offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that his offspring would not be, he, would not be his, so whenever he slept with his brother's wife... He released his seed on the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the Lord's sight, so we put him to death also. Kind of a, 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 a strong passage there. You know, I mean, it's real kind of heavy. The first couple of verses is, is kind of setting this whole thing up. He's given pertinent information. We, he says, at, at that time, Judah left his brothers and settled near uh, an Adulamite. And that Adulamite, his name was Hira. So he's setting all this up. He left his, his brothers and his father, and he went off and settled near Hira. And he had a daughter named Shua. And, well, you know, they kind of hit it off. And, and um, he married her. So Shua was Judah's wife. And she bore him three sons. And that's the whole 
the whole setup right there. He's, he, he's had three sons, probably more sons. They don't list the daughters in that day and age, but we're sure that there's probably more than just three kids. It's just the three boys. Okay. Starting in verse 6, he says that Judah got a wife for Ur, which was his firstborn. You marry off the oldest first. You know, just kind of the way it goes. Um, and her name was Tamar. Now, we've all heard the name Tamar. We kind of all probably know this story, okay? But it says that Ur was Judah's firstborn, and he was evil in the Lord's sight and put him to death. No real detail given. We don't know what he had done. We don't know if there was something specific that he had done. We don't know what is going on. We just know that he was evil in the Lord's sight, and he put him to death. Okay, So Ur is gone, and Tamar is a widow. Now, I've got to, I've got to explain something here. It's called levirate marriage okay in that day and age the oldest boy and you, you know there's three boys here so if the oldest boy dies before having an heir before having a son then it is the next boy's duty to marry her and produce an offspring produce a son for that widow okay it is his duty it's called the levirate marriage okay so it was onan's duty to carry on ur's lineage because ur was the one who was going to carry the name forward into the future it was onan's responsibility to have a child for ur okay now we also have to understand that back in that day and age women didn't work either they had to have a son in order to have, in order to be taken care of for the rest of their lives. They had to have a son if their husband was gone in order to get the inheritance that they needed to take care of her. It was Onan's duty to do this. It was his responsibility to take care of her, okay, in this levirate marriage. So Judah even told him this. He says, sleep with your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law. Later on, it appears in Moses' law. It is a Mosaic law that this is what should be done. Okay? But Onan knew that the offspring, this is verse 9, but Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he released his seed on the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. You see, Onan is probably young at this point, okay? He didn't want the responsibility. He wanted the gratification that went along with it, but he didn't want the responsibility of having a child for his brother that was not going to be his. He knew that child wasn't going to be his, so he's like, what's the point? He wanted his kid to be his kid. It was the fruit of his loins, not his brother's, but yet he's not my son. To, to, to own it, it didn't make any sense. What's the point? Okay? So because he did that, God saw that Onan was evil in his sight as well and put Onan to death. Now see, the point is, is that there are a whole lot of principles in these first 10 sections that need to be covered. So we're going to kind of cover them one at a time. We're not going to be able to get through them all. Um, but we're going to go through the big four. First of all, we have a responsibility to choose the proper people to associate with. It is our duty to choose our friends wisely. For the kids in the room, for the teenagers, hear me on this. Your parents say this all the time. Well, let somebody who is not your parent say the same thing. You have a responsibility to choose your friends wisely. Okay? Let's go back. I'll give you a good reason for that. Okay? It says 
that Judah left his brothers and settled near an Adulamite, an Adulamite named Hira. Judah chose his company. The company he chose were pagans. They didn't follow Yahweh. They didn't follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They followed whatever they darn well pleased. When Judah did that, he made a decision. And when he made that decision, he chose to surround himself with people that weren't exactly up to God's standards. Okay? They didn't know. So, the idea being here that when he did that, Judah didn't have any of, he didn't have a proper woman to marry, so they, he married a pagan woman. Okay. okay? And when she did that, she carried all of her traditions with her. God tells us not to be unequally yoked. In marriage, non-believers aren't supposed to be married to believers. We're not, as believers, we're not supposed to pursue a spouse out of the faith. The reason being is it is going to be very difficult for that believer to operate in a biblical marriage if half the partnership is not biblical. There's a huge problem with that. I, I know people who... One's a Christian, another one's a Muslim. Well, how in the world does that work? I, I mean, I, I, ser- I seriously do. It was, uh, I, was, I think it was in culinary school. It, it was a, a, a lady who her husband was a, a Muslim. Or I've known people who the, the wife was a Christian, but the husband was a, a staunch atheist. How does that work? It doesn't work. We have a responsibility to choose the proper people to associate with, not only in our friendships, but also in our relationships as marriage sake, too. So when you go to choose a mate, teenagers and high schoolers and those kids in the room, when you go to choose a husband or a wife, you have a responsibility to Christ to pursue someone who is a, also a believer, okay? More than likely, Shua probably professed Yahweh as God. But even though you profess God, you also need to, you know, we all need to understand this. Though somebody professes Christianity does not mean that that's what they are. We are to judge the fruit of the tree. You judge the fruit by the tree. Or you judge a tree by the fruit. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. You judge a tree by the fruit. I always say that backwards. Always. But you judge a tree by its fruit. It has to, you know, Shua probably didn't have this, this fear of the Lord that we talk about, this awe, this apprehension, this, this, this awe of God. You know, she didn't, she didn't understand she didn't fear the Lord. You see, our worship isn't supposed to be superficial. We talked about this a few weeks ago, about a month, a month and a, two months ago. Wow, it's been that long, two months ago. Um, beginning of September, about worship. Our worship is not supposed to be superficial, is it? It's supposed to be more than just superficial. Shul was a superficial believer. She brought all of her pagan traditions with her. And God says that we're not supposed to do that. We are supposed to look different than what the world looks like. And I could take that in a whole different direction too, but I need to stay on task. Number two, we have a responsibility to obey God. We have a responsibility to obey God. This includes the behavior in our relationships sexually. This is a tough subject to talk about from the pulpit, but these are things that we need to be talking about. The preachers in this country kind of avoid the sexual subjects because we have maybe kids in here that might not understand, but the more we talk about it, the more these kids are going to understand what it is to have a right relationship with the Lord and with someone else. 
We have a we have a responsibility to behave and obey God in our sexual lives. It is obvious that God saw Onan's disobedience as extremely wicked. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put him to death. God is a loving God, but God is also just. And he demands payment for sins. What we do in our sexual lives makes a difference. You realize that back in, in when we're talking old, you know, these old days, you know, really old days, when we talk about this, Adam and Eve, there was, we don't have any biblical record of a marriage ceremony. You know, there wasn't a priest and, or a minister. He didn't get up in front and, would you repeat after me and have a whole formal wedding ceremony? They didn't go through this. You know what the wedding ceremony was? Consummating the marriage. It was the act of love between a husband and a wife that made the marriage a marriage. So when we go off and we abuse our sexual relationships, you are essentially marrying everybody you, mar- you sleep with. We wonder why we have problems in our country. It's because we're uniting ourselves with people we have no business uniting ourselves with. We have got to see our sexuality as something that is God-given. It is a beautiful thing between a husband and a wife. But outside the context of marriage, it is a sin. I don't care who you are. That's why we're not supposed to live together before we're married, because the temptation is too strong. But on the other hand, once we repent and realize that we've done wrong, we need to break those bonds. We need to cut the chains of the people we drag with us from our history. Okay? We have a responsibility to obey God, not just in obedience to follow His ways, but also sexually. It, 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 it applies to our sexual lives, too. Okay? Number three, we have a responsibility to be responsible. It is, not, it is our duty not to shirk the responsibilities that God gives us. God set on own and the responsibility to produce an heir for his brother. Onan didn't want it. So he didn't. And he went off and did his business, but spilled everything all over the ground and therefore did what was wicked in the Lord's sight. He, he wanted the gratification without having the responsibility. Why I think, I think handing condoms out to children is wrong. Because you're teaching them to sin. Don't teach them to have, practice safe sex. Teach them to abstain. You teach them to abstain so that they don't have to cross that bridge. You don't even go down that path. You don't have to worry about pregnancy. Duh! They know what causes pregnancy these days. Don't do it. It's the way it is. Don't sin against yourself and don't sin against your God. If God assigns us to be responsible for something, then we have got to follow through. You guys know my story. I was called to the ministry at 12, but I completely ran the opposite direction for years because I didn't want the responsibility that went with it. I didn't want it. Onan, I'm very lucky to be alive because God should have put me to death. But he didn't. He didn't. He had grace on me. And he had mercy. And I've sought his forgiveness day in and day out because I did not do what he asked the first time. But thank God that he was patient with me. 
if we are a husband, we are called to be responsible for our families. It's our duty. Don't pass it off on somebody else. If we're a leader in the church, we're the ones who are held responsible for this congregation. It's not just me, but it's all of the leadership, elders and deacons, the board. We are responsible for this body of believers. And if you're a Christian, it's your duty to uphold the gospel and share it with other people who need to hear it. It's your duty, it's your responsibility to share. It is not your duty to hold the grace in that God has given you. Because grace received and not given is no grace at all. You have to give the grace as you've received it. Okay? You have to give the same as you've received it. If you're a parent, you're responsible for your children. You are responsible for your children to be raised in the right ways. If you are a grandparent or great-grandparent, that does not negate you from the responsibility. You still have that responsibility. Because we've all got family members who are not Christian. It's sad, but it's true. We've all got family members, extended family members maybe, that aren't Christian. But still, we have a duty to do right by those children. We still have a duty. And number four, we have a responsibility <clears throat> to take responsibility for our actions. Over and over in this world, it's all about pass the buck. The Republicans blame the Democrats. The Democrats blame the Republicans. The preachers blame the congregation for not wanting to be active. The congregation blames the preacher for not preaching the right things. Parents blame the kids for being unruly, and kids blame the parents for just being downright mean. We don't take responsibility for our actions. We're always passing the buck off on somebody else. It's your responsibility, not mine. It's why marriages fail. It's because they can't take responsibility for their own actions. Marriage is a two-way street, folks. If it's failing, it ain't just one person who's got the problem. It's on both ends of the stick. And therefore, repentance is needed. Don't pass the buck. We have to admit, confess, repent of our actions. We want this country to straighten up. Repentance is the key. We have got to repent of our evil ways. That starts in our own homes. Where it starts. You're not going to change the country by going out in the street corner and just preaching it. It starts in your house. Straighten up your house first. Take the log out of your own eye so that you can take the speck out of somebody else's. As Christians, we have many responsibilities, and it's our duty to be sure that we're upholding the things God calls us to and, and not fail in our responsibilities. Uh, I've got a story here, another one from my, my book of illustrations. Everybody know who Philip Yancey is? You know, yeah, Odie's, so yeah. Oh, Philip Yancey is the editor for um, Christianity Today. Um, writes articles, all kinds of good stuff. Philip Yancey, he's a, he's a great writer. Really, really, really great writer. But in an, ep or in an episode, oh my gosh. <laughs> in, in an uh, article in Christianity Today, Philip Yancey writes the following. When Princess Diana died, I got a phone call from a television producer. Can you appear on our show? He asked, we want you to explain how God could possibly allow such a terrible accident. The 1994 Winter Olympics, when speed skater Dan Jensen's hand scraped the ice, causing him to lose the 500-meter race, his wife Robin cried out, why God again? God can't be that cruel. You remember that? I remember that. I remember watching that race. A young woman wrote James Dobson this letter. Four years ago, I was dating a man and became pregnant. I was devastated. I asked, 
I asked God, why have you allowed this to happen to me? In a professional bout, boxer Ray Boom Boom Mancini slammed his Korean opponent with a hard right, causing a massive cerebral hemorrhage. At a press conference after the Korean's death, Mancini uh, said, sometimes I wonder why God does the things he does. Susan Smith, who pushed her two sons into a lake to drown and then blamed the carjacker for the deed, wrote in her official confession, I dropped to the lowest point when I allowed my children to go down that ramp into the water without without me. I took off running and screaming, Oh God, oh God, no, what have I done? Why did you let this happen? I once watched a television interview with a famous Hollywood actress whose lover had rolled off a yacht in a drunken stupor and drowned. The actress, who probably had not thought about God in months, looked at the camera, her lovely face contorted by grief, and asked bizarrely, how could a loving God let this happen? Perhaps something similar lay behind the television producer's question about Princess Diana. Every one of these examples, these people have not taken responsibility for their own actions. Princess Diana is famous. It's probably not her fault. But it was the photographers that were running her down. Now, of course, the conspiracy theorists are out there that Prince Philip had her killed. Well, whatever. It was the paparazzi. That's what it was. The Winter Olympics, it wasn't God's fault that Dan Jensen lost. It was his own fault. He was the one whose hand scraped the ice. The woman got pregnant and asked why. Did God let this happen to me? It's your responsibility. Quit blaming God for your problems. We have got to take responsibility for our actions. And it starts with us. Quit shirking the responsibility that God gives us, whether it's by taking responsibility for our actions or being responsible in the duties that he gives us or or whatever the case may be to obey him. It's our duty to take responsibility for what he's given us. We're blessed immensely with all kinds of wonderful stuff. It's our responsibility to take care of that stuff. God has been working hard on me. God has been working real hard on me. That I utilize too much technology. There's some things that I pay for that I shouldn't be paying for. Smartphones is one of them. It's ridiculous. I pay $160 a month for a smartphone. Why? What did I do 20 years ago? I had a pad and a pen of paper that had a calendar on it, and I wrote things down with a pen. Oh, God forbid. You know, I mean, these are the things that God is showing me that it's ridiculous that we rely on so much technology. It is my responsibility to to take responsibility for what he's given us. So I'm cleaning house. Hardcore. More ways than one. My urging to you is, you know, maybe maybe God's not moving you to, to clean house, so to speak, but what is the responsibility that God's laid on you that either you are taking responsibility and thank God for that, or what is it that he's moving you to that you're trying to deny? Okay, Today we're going to sing, i got to remember the, the song of invitation. Good thing I have it in my pocket. If, if you need to be baptized this morning, I want to invite you. <laughs> it's at the cross, number 417. It, it's, it's at the cross. It, 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 at, the foot of the gro- at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. I don't care what you've done. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Your wife's going into the prison next week, and these people have probably committed murder and all kinds of atrocious acts, but it doesn't matter what they've done. God still forgives, and you're the same. God still forgives. Give your life to him today. If you need prayer this morning, stand. Sing with me. Come forward, and let's sing at the cross.